It's my great pleasure to be able to introduce Yael Hochberg. And so what I'd like to do is to read her, her formal bio, which is short uh, and to the point, and then I thought I'd tell you something about Yale, which would be valuable. Um, so here, here we go. Uh, Yale Hochberg is the head of the Entrepreneurship Initiative at Rice University and the Ralph S. O'Connor Professor of Entrepreneurship at the Jones Graduate School of Business. She is a research affiliate at MIT Sloan School of Management and a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research. Yale was previously on the faculty of Northwestern uh, Kellogg School of Management and Cornell Johnson School of Management. She's worked in the tech industry. She serves on boards of several early stage startups. Hochberg, Yale was named one of the world's uh, one of the uh, 40 under 40 best business school professors by Poets and Quants, which we follow a lot, and received the Ewing Marion Kaufman Prize Medal for Distinguished Research in Entrepreneurship. She holds a Bachelor's of Science in Industrial Engineering and Management from the Technion Israel Institute of Technology and a PhD of Finance and AM in Economics from Stanford University. I could go on and on about Yale, but what I'd like to say about Yale is that there are a lot of special people in the business school and at Rice University but Yale is, I believe, more special still in a few ways. She's a pathbreaker. There aren't really other professors who do, who do what she does, who can really accomplish in her own discipline, which is really finance, a level of scholarship and respect that commands attention everywhere. I know that everywhere I go, all the deans that I speak to, all the faculty I speak to, they know Yale, they revere her, they're glad we have her. I think they wonder if we'll be able to keep her. And all of that tells me that we're doing the right thing. <laughs> and we're trying to keep her here and, and take advantage of all the skill that she brings. She's a bit of a unicorn in that way, and that what Yale can offer us is not only insight into advancements in finance and a discipline that needs it, and prestige and all the ways that we want recognition, but really helps build the name of the university. Just a week ago, as we were being accredited, which is a five-year review, and we have deans from around the country come, they said to me, and they say to me often, what I know about the Jones School is you're great in entrepreneurship. How do you do that? Well, Yale Hochberg is uh, more responsible than anybody else here for that growth and that strength. And so we're, we're doubly happy to not only be able to celebrate her by offering her this opportunity, but to bring you into uh, her research in a way that is very practical. Because I think for all of what Yale does, she advances her discipline in very fundamental ways. She also has a unique ability to carry forward ideas from ideas to impact, as she states in her title, and to make a difference in the ways that all universities, but maybe most particularly the business schools, want to make a difference. And in an area that we think is especially important to Houston, and especially important to Rice University. I know that our president and everyone around always wants a little bit more of Yale's time. We don't have any more of it. I think we try to keep her as satisfied and as busy, and she's generous and gracious to be here with us today and to share with us some of the fruits of her research and to stimulate ideas in an area that I know is strategically important to the university. So with all that being said, please help me give a warm welcome to our great professor, Yael Hochberg. Can I grab a clicker? Um, well, hello. Um, I'm delighted to be here today, and I thank you guys all for, for coming to listen to me. Um, I'm not going to talk about finance today, if you haven't figured out from the title. Um, I am going to talk about something that, um, as Peter said, I think is very relevant today to the city of Houston. It is relevant today to the future of the United States of America. It is relevant today to our university. And it is uh, really a talk about what it is that we can do to take advantage more of the research and the amazing discoveries that get uh, made every single day in universities like Rice University. Um, and it's the product of how I spent my pandemic, which was talking to technology transfer officers at universities across the United States and understanding really where impediments stood um, and where we perhaps could do better at, at trying to think about how we take this research from idea to impact. So um, that's what I'll be talking about today, and um, I, I hope you'll find it, uh, find it interesting. So to start this out, we have to talk a little bit about universities. Now, we're all here in a university, so most of you will be um, very familiar with um, some of what I'm going to talk about. Um, but I want to shape this in a, a specific way. First of all, if we think about what the role of university in society is, that role has really evolved and expanded in recent decades. Right? We've had a traditional mission, uh, mission which was educating the, you know, the young people of 
um, you know, of the world, discovering and disseminating new knowledge. Um, in today's world, we've also evolved into institutions whose mission is to translate discovery into technological invention and to think about how we commercialize those inventions. This is manifested in mission statements of universities across the country and across the globe. Um, in the last, you know, since uh, the last 40 some years, um, there's been a massive proliferation of technology transfer offices um, and sort of functions that are meant to try and take this technology and get it out of the university um, to create real impact. Yet, if we actually look at the numbers, that you know, process of technology transfer is often stymied in practice. A lot of the impediments tend to be organizational. And the beautiful thing about that is it offers opportunities, if we're willing to take a critical look, um, to really think about how we can address those things uh, with what I call reasonable resources and effort. Um, so I'm going to dive into that. And to start with that, I think it's useful to think about kind of where the research university came from. And if we want to talk about where the research university model came from, um, we dial ourselves back to Vannevar Bush. Um, and guy we, we like a lot. He was a professor at MIT um, during World War II. He headed the unit, um, US Office of Scientific Research and Development. He was the initiator of the Manhattan Project. Um, he was the one who pressed for the creation of the National Science Foundation. And he was the first presidential science advisor. And the vision that uh, Bush had for the research university looked something like this. You know, ultimately, taxpayers provide money to the government. The government will provide some of that in support of the university. The university, in turn, will produce knowledge and workforce. Um, and that will flow into the economy, into corporations, who will provide goods and services that go back to the benefit of the taxpayer. And ultimately, I think, as universities, we've done really, really well with the knowledge transfer through workforce training. We haven't done quite as well with the transfer of research into new corporations, goods, and services. Now, you know, the, the, the um, policymakers out there have been trying to think about how we do this. We've all been thinking about how we should do this for quite some time. So I said, you know, the role of the university's changed over the last 40 some years. Um, this dials back to um, a particular act of Congress in 1980 called the Bayh-Dole Act. And if you look back in kind of history until the 1980s, most un American universities were very, very reluctant to even engage in commercialization of research. So if you dial back and look at the um, kind of statements from, from, um, from that period of time, you know, there'll be things like patenting and licensing of technology removes knowledge from the public domain, doesn't put it out there. Commercialization compromises the academy's commitment to open science. Profit motives undermine the purity of the scientific endeavor. And many universities actually forbade commercialization of biomedical research. Um, many universities did not patent at all or forbade patenting of, of university inventions. And on top of it, the legal regime we had in the United States kind of disincentivized the commercialization of university research to begin with. If you were funded by federal dollars, which most researchers at universities are, um, the rights to the intellectual property that was developed from that research were held by the federal government. And if you were a researcher, you could patent, but you couldn't keep any of the royalties or um, other um, rents that might come from licensing those patents unless you had negotiated something special with the government, which was pretty hard to do. And as a result, most of the innovations that were out there in the public domain were really just not publicized or commercialized. Um, when the Bayh-Dole Act came about in 1980, um, it was really motivated by a debate that was focused on American competitiveness. Um, the, the debate in Congress was about the benefits of public knowledge and open science versus how do we provide incentives to innovate and commercialize research. Um, and it, again, stemmed from a lot of concern about the US's ability to maintain economic competitiveness um, and, and try to think about how we provide more incentives for innovation. So with you know, Bush's model in mind, um, what Bayh-Dole did was give universities the right to patent to own rights to and to keep royalty revenues from innovations that were developed using federal research funding. This was a big deal for universities. Um, it came with some quid pro quos. Universities had to actively promote the commercialization of the technologies. They had to grant the federal government um, a non-exclusive license, typically for research. 
they had to share royalties with the inventor. The PIs, the, the faculty at the university who were creating these new discoveries. Um, and you know, through a variety of additional um, acts of Congress that kind of added and, and moved this, um, this same theme forward, um, ultimately um, we removed a lot of the restrictions there were on universities um, and their ability to benefit from patenting of the research that faculty do and transfer those property rights to other people. So this has turned into some successes that we're all very familiar with, right? So someone probably typed Jones School of Business into Google today to figure out how to get the link to get their directions to come here. Um, I certainly woke up in the morning and took an Allegra to help with my seasonal allergies. Um, I'm guessing that some of the students here probably picked up a Gatorade somewhere in the RMC at some point. All of these are university inventions. Gatorade has the Gator because it came out of the University of Florida. Google is the famous story of coming out of Stanford, right? Um, at least some of us probably got a Moderna shot sometime in, uh, in the last few years. Um, you know, Moderna what came out of um, a university, came out of MIT. Lyrica, um, which some, you know, if, you, if you've got a bad back like I do, you might take as well every morning, um, came out of Northwestern, was a big drug. Um, some of you probably have Bose headsets. You're probably doing some work taking notes, if not here, then in class. Um, or you know, in your lab on an e-ink tablet of some sort. That was invented by my dad's neighbor, Joe Jacobson, over at MIT as well. Um, and you know, we can continue to throw things out. The x-ray came from a guy named Rentgen at the University of Wurzburg back in 1895. Genentech came out of the University of Berkeley. Raytheon out of MIT. They're big names that we know came out of university research. And this is all great. At the same time, only about five to 10% of university patents are commercialized, and most university discoveries aren't even patented to begin with. Right? These are small percentages. If you look at some of the numbers, um, so I, I grabbed it's a, sort of an easily searchable statistic um, back from 2018, so we're five years back, but the numbers really, um, from what I can tell, haven't changed. And you look at the close to 200 universities in the A, the AUTM, Autumn uh, Database, Association of University Technology Managers, um, you'll find, see that you know, the, the universities together filed about 17,000 patents. Um, about 7,600 of those were actually granted by the USPTO, and only 868 of them were actually turned into some sort of product or service. Right? And again, a lot of patents, a lot of things are not patented. And universities have just not been efficient or that good at getting a lot of the federally funded research discoveries that we have to have real market impact. Um, and you know, at most universities, the money we bring in from licensing those inventions, the incentive we were supposed to have, doesn't even cover the costs of patent. Okay. So why is this? What can we do potentially to change it um, here and at universities across um, the country? So um, to start thinking about this, we have to look at the lay of the land of commercialization. So I'm going to start with um, a common creature here in the audience, which is the faculty member. So here's our faculty member in their lab. Um, and with um, any luck, if they're doing their job right, they come up with some fantastic discoveries. Um, typically, those discoveries um, are then peer reviewed. They're published in scientific journals. And if the professor does a good job of this and publishes a good number of these papers, and along the way also does a decent job of uh, teaching um, students and transmitting knowledge to the youth and maybe mentoring some PhD students there, um, and does a little bit of sitting on university committees and giving back. Um, with any luck, they become a distinguished professor, university professor perhaps like Moshe over there, um, and if they're really lucky, they win a nice shiny gold medal. Um, this is you know, what life is like for most faculty members. And they are very much motivated in this process by producing that peer-reviewed research. Right? And if you think about the discoveries that are made, right, what happens to them and where are they in this, this diagram? For a lot of faculty, they're just sort of, this is where the cycle ends. But if you do make a discovery and you do want to take it forward or it has potential to go forward, what would happen? So by dole actually requires all of us as faculty to disclose um, you know, our inventions 
um, anyone who's uh, funded by federal research to the university. The university owns our intellectual property. Um, and in order for us to be able to take this forward and commercialize, we've got a little bit of a timer on things. We have to do this before we go out and present or publish, um, ideally. Um, and the way this works is that a researcher will go out, get a form called an invention disclosure. They will think about the um, invention that they have created. They will describe it. They talk about the inventors that are involved, the funding sources and sponsors. Um, and then a university technology transfer office, an intermediary function that lives in the administration of the university, has to decide, do we patent or do we not patent? So what determines that? Well, questions like, is it novel enough to patent? Not everything is patentable. What already exists? Is there a use case for it? Is there utility for it? Is there some real commercial potential? Um, do we think that someone in the industry will be willing to license it from the university? Right? Patents cost money. So the tech transfer office has to decide whether or not it's going to patent things. And if we choose to patent, the university will then own those IP rights. And we, the faculty, are listed as inventors on the patent and um, share in the revenue that the university receives. Um, and typically, this will be about a third of the revenue that will come in will go directly to the inventors. About a third of it tends to go back to the schools to support the research. And about a third of it goes to support the Allen Center, say, at a place like Rice. If we have that patent, if we decide that we've met the, the criteria, we want to go out and patent, um, usually this will take the form of the university going out and filing a provisional application with the USPTO. These provisionals are important because, like I said, ideally we want to be doing these disclosures before we go out and actually publicly talk about our research and our discoveries. And the reason for that is we have a very limited time period in order to patent. Um, if we file a provisional, that doesn't mean we're going to get a patent. In fact, it's not even evaluated by the USPTO. All it does is set a date. And that is the date that helps us determine um, you know, if somebody else files the same thing. And often discoveries get made in parallel at different institutions. Who would get um, the claim um, on, that, uh, on that patent? And then our clock starts. We have one year to convert from the provisional to a non-provisional application. And in order to do that full application, we've got to have the strongest data possible. Um, and researchers will spend um, a lot of time trying to produce that. Not all provisionals are going to be converted. Um, and a lot of that's going to be based on commercial potential, the likelihood that we'd actually be granted a patent. Um, and you know, if we do, if we file it, we get our 20-year patent lifetimer. Somebody from the USPTO evaluates that application. And maybe we grant a patent or we get um, rejected. Slightly more complex than that. But that's a good sort of lay of the land overview. Any luck, this is what we wind up with. It's a patent by uh, one of our colleagues um, here, at, uh, here at Rice, Christian Nicola. Okay. So now, let's say we want to commercialize. We've got a couple of paths forward. So one path forward is to take this through a startup. This is a pretty common way that faculty like to think about taking technology out of the university and putting it out into the world. And the path that looks something like this, form a team, launch a company, negotiate a license to the technology because your invention is owned by the university, hopefully then go out, raise some funding and some resources to support the venture, um, commercialize and scale, produce some revenue. Some of that is going to go back to the university and hopefully support the academic mission. So this is commercialization through a startup. As an alternative, you might commercialize through an industry partner, identify a partner, Negotiate a license, once again, commercialize and scale, producing revenue, and hopefully some royalties or other fees that come back to the university and to the inventor. This looks pretty straightforward. The thing is that there's a few challenges along the way, and that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, the first of these is that a lot of the discoveries we make here at the university are too early. They're not far enough along to actually be candidates for licensing. Right? Even if we can patent a discovery, that doesn't mean that we can actually create something out of the technology that in, in a sort of a commercial setting. It doesn't mean we can manufacture at scale. It doesn't mean the technology will be stable if we're trying to create vol at volume. You know, and if you think about the reward system for us as professors, we're rewarded for making new discoveries. Right? We are rewarded for pushing forward the scientific frontier. 
Um, we are not rewarded typically for taking something from the concept that we found, the new discovery, to actual scale and de-risking it. Publications are what matter in most universities for tenure and promotion, right? And scientific publications, peer-reviewed publications, come from new discoveries, right? That constant pushing forward of the scientific frontier. So what happens is that most fundamental research at the university stops at the discovery level, at the discovery level. We call sort of the basic or fundamental um, uh, research level. And that's okay, we're still creating lots and lots of knowledge. But if we want to take this out into the private market, the challenge for us is that the private market isn't willing to take on that translational risk. When you go to an industry partner and say to them, I have this really cool thing, I've discovered the carbon nanotube, they want to know, okay, but can you produce strings of it? Can you spin it out? Is it stable? Does it hold? Can it be turned into something useful? Can you show me data on X, Y, and Z to prove that, in fact, I could take this and use this commercially? Um, all of that, that's applied research, translational research. Most faculty are not doing that, right? It's not produced, it doesn't produce the publications. Um, if you're a startup, you have similar challenges, right? Um, if you want to go to an investor, the investor too wants to know that in fact this has the potential to turn into something um, that is um, able to be sold in a commercial setting. They too want that de-risking. Um, basic research tends to prove out concepts. It doesn't prove it can be scaled, manufactured, or applied successfully in commercial settings. Um, and I once heard a tech transfer um, official refer to this as, you know, the investors want a fully baked cake not a scoop of flour and an untried and unproven recipe. And you know, that, that's the, the equivalent. You also hear quotes like they show up with a flour and sugar and the, the investor wants a donut, things of that sort. Heard variations on this, on this quote. But this is true for in industry partners as well, right? We found sort of the thing that we think is going to be the magic, but we don't know yet that the magic spell actually works. Um, and the result is, is that, you know, when we talk about that, those diagrams where we say, hey, we form a company, we get a team, we license the technology, or we find an industry partner, we license the technology, in many, many cases, getting to that license requires many more steps and much more investment than we will have made here at the university in terms of the basic research discoveries that we have. And if you think again about that faculty member, for most faculty members, this is what satisfies us, right? We make new discoveries, we publish new papers, we push forward the boundaries, we teach, we educate, we mentor students. And we're not interested in running a startup. We're not interested in necessarily doing that translational research. We want to do fundamental breakthrough work. Now, you have that challenge of, well, where is that translational work gonna come from? In most universities, Translation and commercialization support is just not there. It's not been the place where we focus, when we focus on creation of new knowledge. Um, and most of these discoveries are gonna require a considerable amount of this translational or applied research to prove out the feasibility or the scalability. So if we don't have that mechanism at most universities, that's a problem. And our faculty member wants to keep pushing forward on really interesting new discoveries and often is not interested in doing translational research that isn't going to provide those scientific publications, that isn't going to provide the next grant. And we don't have a category of researcher, right, that is incentivized to do this work. PhD students trying to, again, find fundamental breakthroughs so that they can graduate with their PhD. Our postdocs are trying to publish papers so that they can get academic jobs. There's nobody out there who's motivated to be doing this work. The other piece of this is that, you know, in many cases, we also just don't have the support of physical infrastructure to allow some of this to happen. And that's true in particular um, when we're talking about a situation where someone's gone out and already formed a startup company. So if you think about a lot of the discoveries we make on university campuses, the ones that are really interesting, a lot of them are really deep tech, hard tech, things that, that require, you know, very specialized equipment. And most of that equipment is only on campuses. It's often very expensive. It's funded by federal grants for specific uses, um, most of which are gonna be for basic research. Um, and 
you know, risk averse institutions are you know, sort of correctly concerned to a certain extent about allowing too much commercial activity to happen on campus. Um, there are tax status issues that come up, um, some of which are, are, are valid and some of which are just risk averse uh, institutions tripping over their own risk aversion. But the reality is, is that often if you do want to start these things, if you do want to do the translational research, we don't quite know where to do it. We don't have the infrastructure to do it, and particularly that's true if we've gone and spun off a startup. And then the third piece of this is that, you know, as a faculty member, even if you decided you wanted to go through with this, you usually don't have somewhere immediate to turn for industry and commercial expertise, right? Often you need those networks in order to be able to help identify the applications for your technology to guide that translational risk and, de and, and, and translational work and de-risking of discoveries so that the licensees will be interested in licensing um, and to help develop commercial partnerships. Um, and you know, true, if you look in our ecosystem on campus, we have ac you know, academics, students, and, and support staff um, in the various administrative functions, we don't usually have people whose job it is to be sort of industry experts um, on a particular industry um, or tracking and partnering with, um, with industry to understand what new things they're looking to, to develop. Now, if once we get past the translation piece, we also have our tech transfer office. And the tech transfer office, which came about um, you know, kind of in the wake of Baidol, to, you know, a great extent has been kind of the, you know, despite its potential, I'd say, the neglected child. It's often viewed as a cost center. Um, and in many cases, universities have set incentives to try and reduce that cost center. So, you know, historically, if you look at a lot of tech transfer offices, they've been measured on short-term revenue or suppression of patenting costs. Um, and as a result of having really short-term metrics about how much dollars are you spending or how much dollars have you brought in this year, you don't often see the service culture or mentality that is necessary in order to really think about long-term licensing, long-term revenue, long-term patenting, and what the effects of what you're doing are. Uh, most tech transfer officers flip over every three to four years. Now, that's not long enough to see any success out of a startup or even out of a big company license. This disincentivizes filing of patents. It disincentivizes licensing to startups where it's really hard to collect money up front or recoup your patent costs. And if you are a startup in particular, um, you often have very specific and different licensing needs in order to be successful. Upfront fees are typically infeasible. So if you want to recover your patenting costs, which can be you know, in the you know, mid to high uh, five digits, um, that's not going to really happen with a startup that's just you know, a graduate student out of the lab or a faculty member out of the lab. Um, recovery of those costs has to be deferred. Um, startups don't have time to sit around and, and go back and forth 20 times with lawyers. They have a limited lifespan and limited resources, and they need quick turnaround on things. Um, and a lot of those types of um, needs don't fit with short-term metrics like producing revenue. And the third piece of this, which really comes from the fact that manpower in the patent office has been, um, has been limited by the fact that it's viewed as a cost center, is that what you really need in order for these offices to function properly is a set of diverse skills. And they don't exist in one person. You need skills and, and people who have the ability to determine market applications and commercial potential. You need people who know how to protect IP. You need people who know how to negotiate license terms that maximize the chance of success for any given entity that you're negotiating with. And you need expertise and, and somebody who has the skill to go out and market those technologies to commercial partners. Those are very different skill sets. But if your Office of Technology Transfer only has a couple of people, and they're trying to balance all of that with the same people and all doing this, all these functions, which is the case in many, many universities, that's going to be very limiting. So how do we potentially solve some of these problems? Well, um, some universities out there have been kind of more successful at, at doing some of this. And over the years, we've managed to accumulate some knowledge about 
what kinds of things work better at you know, kind of reducing some of these organizational burdens and um, helping, kind of helping remove the, the barrier to translation. So if lots of universities' discoveries might be too early to be candidates for licensing, the solution for us is to think as a university about how we can provide the resources and the manpower for translational and applied research. And it's very easy for me to say that, but university budgets are limited, and we all know that. Um, so how do we get those mechanisms? How do we get the funding? How do we get that dedicated staff for on-campus de-risking pre-company spin-out, which is effectively a new class of researcher? Um, here's where we get to circle one of the things on that faculty slide which is to take advantage of the fact that we have PhD students and postdocs, and not every single one of them wants to go into academia. Many of them are actually going to wind up going into industry. Yet we don't provide them with any training um, or education um, that would help them with that integration. And many of them are very interested in pursuing their research into um, the commercial market. And we can take advantage of that using PhD students, using dedicated postdocs, who have a desire to go into industry or startups. And as a bonus, this serves our education mission. It serves our commercialization objectives while also serving the main mission that we've always had as a university um, and allowing us to do that on the university campus as part of the educational mission. If translation and commercial support are not there, well, we can create that. We can think about, uh, about it, and it will serve our education purposes. We can create training programs. We can think about mentorship and guidance. We can think about how we go out and help people find funding sources to do that translational research. Supportive physical infrastructure is a little bit more difficult. It requires often that we make actual capital investments, but they're capital investments that could have real payoffs. How do we think about creating something on campus or adjacent to campus for startups to really move forward on translational research on hard tech? wet labs, maker space, prototyping spaces, co-working spaces. Um, and many universities are, are doing this actively now. And if we're missing the industrial and, and commercial expertise and the connections to kind of you know, figure out the applications, well, many universities are starting to think in the direction of, should we have a dedicated commercialization function? Why shouldn't we have a dedicated commercialization function with experts? How can we take advantage of entrepreneurs who are out there in our alumni community or in our city to be entrepreneurs and residents to help provide that to our faculty? Relatively speaking, with the exception of the physical infrastructure piece, these are things we can do without massive investment. They require investment and they require a change in thinking and, and change in culture. Um, but a lot of it is about rethinking what our organization needs to look like in order to get that long-term payoff from the research. Um, and you know, if we can do this, if we can identify applications, if we can guide translational work, if we can help build those commercial partnerships, we'll have a much better chance of transferring more of our discoveries out into um, the world. So at the Office of Technology Transfer, what does this look like? Well, it looks like incentives being set the way that an economist might set incentives, which is to match the long-term goals. So let's come up with metrics that encourage licensing and technology transfer to the outside. Let's take away the emphasis on short-term revenues. Right? Let's have a long-term outlook and recognize that the payoff comes potentially in a decade, or maybe even longer than that. Let's think about how we draft licenses and address the needs that startups have. Right? Let's think about how we can creatively defer fees, how we can stage payments using milestones of success, can we think about owning equity in the startups that come out of our university? Can we think about how we reduce turnaround times by having contracts that don't need much negotiation in order to go through? These are all things that we can do and that the universities who are best at this have started to do and are doing every day. When it comes to the different skill sets that are required, this requires a little bit of a change in thinking organizationally. We need to separate out functions. We should recognize the fact that mar figuring out market applications and having that industry expertise, protecting intellectual property, negotiating licenses or marketing technologies, these are different things. They require different functions. Um, and they require some coordination across the functions. But we really need to start thinking about 
how we invest in getting not a staff member who can try desperately to do all of it at once, but people who can be experts in their area and dedicated in their area to produce better results. So in ideal world, we would have something that looks like this. We would have education for students and postdocs, and frankly, for faculty. This would be a competitive advantage for a university at the national level in recruiting faculty, in recruiting graduate students, and it gives us skills for our postgraduates when, our, when they're not entering academia, when they're going into industry. We should have a way and a mechanism to do pre-spin-out translation and de-risking here on campus. If we do it pre-spin-out, it's research. It can happen in the labs. It can happen on campus, and it obviates the need for the physical infrastructure. Um, and part of that just involves us funding a new class of researcher effectively. And some of that will be through postdocs, and it can be through the PhD students who are, are really interested in pursuing these things. It's thinking about the right licensing options um, so that people don't have to worry about putting together the startup right away, and they know that they have some time. Um, and it's thinking about how to put together the knowledge that's necessary to determine what we need to do in order to translate and de-risk. On the licensing side, it's developing a service mentality. It's thinking about express licenses, quick turnaround, deferred fees. And in terms of post spin out, it's thinking about what kind of facilities should we be creating adjacent to the university or off campus that has the appropriate infrastructure to support the faculty startups that we spin out into the world and give them the best chance possible to be successful. And then we also need a corporate and industry interface. We need people who can showcase faculty and student research to the outside world at, while knowing what the corporate needs and interests are, who can showcase our patent portfolio, and who have the ability to assess commercial potential in a real and material way. And if we can put these things together, we can probably do a much better job of accelerating the inventions out of the university and into, um, and into the world. A lot of this ultimately comes down to culture and education. You need a culture shift from top administration down through the deans and through the departments. Right? You need to reward and recognize commercialization activity at tenure and promotion. You need to put together incentives and resources to dedicate lab and student time for translational activities. You need to develop role models and mentorship and set that culture for future generations of researchers and students. You need a culture shift in graduate education in the sciences and engineering as well. Right? Most PhD students aren't going into academia. But most PhD students and doctoral fellows, they're not going to get training on how to operate or integrate into industry as part of their, as part of their PhD. We should be providing that. We should help them learn how to commercialize the research that they've dedicated their, you know, the, these years of their life, prime years of their life to. Um, and we as faculty should figure out how to enable this how to release them to learn these skills and integrate it into the curriculum that, uh, that we provide. And it's not just education for students, it's really training for faculty as well. Right? New and existing faculty often don't even know what the process is or what their obligations are to disclose. We see this every day with faculty who come into Lilly to ask questions about what the process is. Faculty need training to understand the why, the how, and the when of, you know, to take their, of when to take their research out of the university, when to incorporate that startup, when to hire people, when to put together that team, when to put together the founder's agreement. And you know, best practices on what the role of a faculty member should be in that endeavor, depending on whether they want to dedicate their time to continuing with basic fundamental research, or whether they want to dedicate their time to pursuing their startup. Um, and these are things we know how to do. We, we have the, the ability to do this training. We just have to make room in our curriculum for this to actually happen um, in a way that, you know, outside of the business school where we train this stuff, train on this stuff every single day. And we need effectively to be celebrating rather than denigrating entrepreneurship and commercialization and the applied work that takes these um, findings out into the world. From a policy perspective, and this is more difficult, there are capital injections that are needed. You need grants for the commercialization researcher class. You need grants for translational research on labs in campus. Um, you need funds for building the facilities that aren't going to you know, compromise the university tax status. You need funds for graduate, and stu graduate student and faculty education. 
And this can't come at the expense of basic research. But the interesting thing is that federal agencies have spent the last decade coming to this exact conclusion and realizing that this has to happen. Pockets of funding are becoming available. They're becoming available through Department of Defense, through Department of Energy, through the NIH. Um, and these offer opportunities to actually go out in the same way that we write grants for basic research, to write grants for translational research and fund dedicated commercialization postdocs and dedicated fellows who can work, dedicated research scientists who can work on this. Basic research funding more and more is being tied back to commercialization plans. So we have an imperative. We have to figure out how to do this if we want to be able to continue to push forward basic research. And we can't forget as well that philanthropy is an, op is an option. Many of our alums are very interested in un seeing how they can help the impact of the university and the research that we do every day become greater in this world. Um, they don't just want to build buildings. They, just don't, they don't want to just fund chairs. Um, and there are people out there and foundations and others who are really interested in seeing how we can do better as universities in translating the dollars that come from the taxpayer for federally funded research into real impact um, in our society. So the imperative for all this is very clear, right? We need to be innovating more and taking advantage of the innovation that happens in universities every day because our competitive advantage as a country is at stake. Our GDP growth and our standard of living is at stake. Entrepreneurship and innovation are the drivers of economic growth in the US. Our ability to defend ourselves in a new geopolitical environment is at stake. And we're missing opportunities to harness what we're already inventing every day within the university. The payoffs are long term, but they're great payoffs. We can improve our communities. We can improve human quality of life. We can better upskill our science and engineering workforce. And I think most importantly, we can create a virtuous cycle where ultimately the payoffs from this that come back into the university can be used to fuel even more invention and even more innovation um, here within our research institutions. So here at Rice, this work is already underway. We've admittedly just started, but it's happening. We have a new office of innovation um, with resources uh, for translational applied research that are being designed and built and hopefully soon implemented. We have a commercialization function, an AVP for commercialization that is going to be hired soon. We are thinking actively about what infrastructure we need to be building. And we are working actively on translation and commercialization training and education. Um, for the PhD students in the room, you should think about innovation fellows, which we run through Lilly, where we take PhD students, we buy out their time from their lab one day a week to work on commercializing and building market plans for their research and doing that translational work. Um, we are working on a new commercialization academy for faculty and graduate students, lecture series and workshops and boot camps where you can learn about the process of taking IP out of the university, about the process of building a startup, about the process of commercializing technology. And mentorship and guidance that you know, can help those who are interested move their projects forward. We're overhauling the tech transfer office. We are about to hire a new AVP of technology transfer. New people with new approaches and a service mentality to change the way that we think about the functions within OTT and how we think about licensing. And policy examination so that we can do a better job of enabling faculty aspirations and do a better job of um, impact, um, impacting through our research on the world. All of this is to further our university mission, which is the contributions to the betterment of our world. So thank you very much for, for listening, and I'm happy to take questions.